Um, so, uh, did everyone get an agenda or see the agenda that I sent out? Doug, I don't know if I. There you go. Um, and did everyone have a chance to review the mi the minutes from our last meeting? Tell so, any questions or anything, we could get that out of the way, and then we'll turn it over to our uptown plan presentation. So, any questions or comments on the minutes from last time? So if someone wanted to make a motion and we could approve those and I'll send them off. I motion they be approved. And if someone could second that. I wasn't here, so I'm not oh, doing okay. anything. <laughs> awesome. So that takes care of our real official stuff. And again, we talked a lot about uh, Blue Heron Park and really without knowing the next phase, it seems foolish to spend a lot of time at, at uh, um, Blue Heron and so before we can so, get into that, can we take a detour for a quick that, minute? Absolutely. So two quick detours. Karen just told me something. The hurricane today hit Pine Island, uh, Florida, which is uh, north of Tampa. Some of you may know or may not know, our second pirate ship at uh, Pirate Ship Playground at Outhouse Park is actually exact replica of the Pine Island. And we were looking for a pirate ship, and I couldn't find one. I was there with my dad, and I took a picture of it. And that's the company we contacted to create. The now we'll know ship. if it'll stand up during. Well, I was going to say. Right now, exactly. I thought you were going to say that it floated <laughs> yeah. all the way down there or no, something. So, no, so uh, yeah. I mean, they might have a bad. used it's one a for sale. Yeah, right. Maybe can we you had a third one? Can so. you get from Sucker Brook down to Florida no. by water? Uh, well, actually, no. <laughs> you can from Seneca Lake, but yeah, not but from not Canada. Canada <laughs> well, like. All right. Yeah. Where's the outlet go? The outlet uh, goes, uh, well, actually, the outlet goes to the Erie Canal, I guess, technically. <laughs> you couldn't get a boat, but yeah. you could get a kayak. The pirate ship, maybe. Um, all right, Lindsay and I have some exciting stuff to share with you. Lindsay, I have copies of this before we get into the outhouse. I'm going to pass this around if you want to start talking about it, and I'll jump in when. when... Ooh, all right. Uh, you're passing around the evaluation of the YMCA recreation program, correct, Doug? Is that what you're yeah. passing out? Right. Awesome. All right. So the committee, I believe most of you are aware that, you know, I've, Doug and I have been working on an agreement with an entity to possibly take over our recreation programs. Well, that entity is, in fact, the YMCA. Um, so what Doug is passing around is just what our program would look like next year if the YMCA was to take over our summer camps versus the city. So to start out, I mean, cost is everything, right? Um, it's going to save us money. So right now, the proposal that we are in the works, it would only cost the town $18,000 to the YMCA versus the 20000 that we spend um, with the city. The camp itself is going to jump from the six-week program that we currently have to 10 weeks. So it essentially is going to cover the entire summer period that kids are out of school. So that June 26th, right up until um, September 1st. The hours of the day camp at Onanda are gonna go from 9.30, or sorry, it used to be 9.30 to 3.30. It's expanded to 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. for more coverage. Um, the outhouse program will also be extended um, from the six weeks to an eight week program. Um, and that those hours of operation are also going to be a little bit more expanded, but not fully expanded like the Onanda experience that we're hoping for. Um, something else that I am personally excited about <laughs> Uh, the YMC is going to provide lifeguards while the camp is open. So from that like 8 to 6 p.m., they're staffing Onanda Beach with lifeguards, giving the town the ability to staff Butler Beach sooner than we normally would, um, focusing more on the weekends, and then really just a two-hour gap in the evening. So um, as far oh, as like oh, our lifeguard... The beach oh, at sorry, Onanda would still be open to the public also, even while the... Lifeguards are there from the from the Y. This is amazing. The extended it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> so let me tell you something else that's really exciting too. So um, we've talked about obviously Onanda being underutilized. Like we have that gorgeous lake front, and with our our current camps, they're okay, but we can do so much more. The YMCA wants to do more on the waterfront, like teaching some kayaking skills, canoe skills. And it's all going to be at their cost. Um, and obviously, they would hold all the liability and everything like that. And this is what they specialize in. So it's nothing new for them to take this on. Um, but they also offer any of our residents could apply for financial assistance for the program. But there is also a benefit to our town residents where they would get $40 off 
the YMCA member price, even if they are not a Y member. Um, so that's a huge benefit for our residents. Um, let's see. And then, oh, also very exciting. Um, they're willing to hold a class for our lifeguards as well. So all the training and certifications for the lifeguards that the town needs to hire independently, um, they're going to offer a class, which is something that I've identified as, you know, a, a need to obviously get and retain lifeguards. Um, and then also there's the potential for an a la carte option for transportation um, from a location like Outhouse to drive people down, the kids down to Onanda. Um, if that was something someone wanted to do, or they could just drop the kids off like they normally would. But I don't know, this is a huge win-win. I mean, just the YMCA covering the lifeguard portion and just covering that cost saves us around 20,000, probably a little bit more. Um, and then really the only thing coming out of our pocket is the $18,000 that we give to the YMCA. And then obviously we, as the town, you know, we take care of the grounds and the property and that maintenance, but it's, I'm ridiculously excited. <laughs> And, and Lindsay, we would still have our park rangers down at Onanda, right? And, and yeah, nothing. nothing watch the public as, use and yeah, nothing as far as our operations change, um, except for the fact that the camp is just being run by a different entity, um, and that they're covering lifeguards, which they actually have higher standards um, through Department of Health than than we would for their requirements for the camp. So essentially, they they have I hate to say it, but better trained lifeguards on duty during that time. Well, and then the other thing is because of the extended hours versus that was one of the reasons why our program was always six hours, because the standards for the certification through the Department of Health were at a lower level. The expanded programming requires additional certifications that the Y offer that the Y has. employees have and and operate. So <laughs> it's a much more structured program with uh, lesson planning, with uh, topics, with all kinds of different stuff. I know they talked to us about um, having one group based out of the upland. Almost like every day there would be like multiple avenues, right? There would be a group on the upland for a while that would be doing nature stuff, and then. They might rotate around with one of the other groups that then may go down to the beach and then another group may go to the arts and crafts. very very structured camp experience Sounds like what's everyone's thoughts is there excitement are you guys excited i think it's a great opportunity it's a yeah. so it yeah. is. it's a win-win opportunity and but the the extended hours i think are the uh the critical factor that has always been a problem with what do you do with your kids after day camp? Yeah, that, I mean, as a parent myself, I mean, that's, I couldn't use our programs and I have great working hours, you know? Um, so I well, do you think have, it's a You have a great boss. <laughs> I do, yeah, I am very lucky. Not everyone has that, you know? <laughs> it's the extended hours that we've heard complaints about for many, many yes, years, so, no. but it's also the structure. It's also the flexibility. This would be a one year, trial I was with the law um so let's see how it goes they're very interested in working with us coming to the community and, and really partnering with us this is now the rochester y that's mm -hmm. taking over the canada ymca and it becomes part of the much larger rochester finger lakes programming we've also talked to them about motion junction especially after the Y's open and a whole inclusive camp program experience also associated with that. They're very excited, they're very interested, but Lindsay took them down to Ananda and they fell in love with it. And then that immediately became the focus for 2023 of how can we partner on a program together, specifically an expanded experience at Ananda. This, this is long overdue. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the current Y was not community oriented in my opinion at all. Um, and uh, it's great to see uh, a new generation, Y generation coming into town and looking to support the community, not just their own needs. Uh, and I said that on a recording. There are some numbers you should know, just because, you know, there, there probably will be some questions. So I believe in 22, our residents paid approximately $125. Isn't that right, Lindsay, for the, yep. the yeah, 125 for Onanda. Right, but that was a six hour. Yeah, that was a six hour experience, right? So Correct, what yep. we're talking about with the Y 
is a seven hour experience at outhouse for 150. So it's essentially, that's almost the same, but that would be outhouse. The experience, the extended experience for the 11 hours at Onanda, one of the numbers that they threw out to us would have been uh, 288 minus $40 for town residents, so 248. Uh, but that's, you know, that's double the time period, right? Because you had so many different folks. And they also, Lindsay touched on it, but the phone broke up just when she said it. Oh, sorry. They <laughs> offer a, a scholarship program, a financial aid assistance for any family that needs it. And they have a program that we've never been able to offer that before. So there's just so many more things that we'll be able to offer with this program than what we've ever been able to do before. Is that a weekly, monthly, a, or total? That's a weekly. weekly. Okay. 248 a week for the yes. 10 weeks? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And the town will always have control over what those fees would be set at. No, or, no. Well, have no control over that. That's set by the Y. Set by the y. Yeah. So you're not you're not committed. Yeah, but this would be a one year like I said trial. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the average um, weekly rate for a child for daycare during the summer? Do you know? Does anybody know? <laughs> like, the uh, the young I know. I well, because I am a teacher, I don't have to do it, but I know it's it's high. We have a it's town employee minutes. in the town hall right now that's paying eighteen hundred dollars a month for childcare for one kid. For one kid, yeah. Hmm. It's like more than a mortgage. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> Well, that's why and there's all the talk about <laughs> to make up the cost, right? There's no equity, <laughs> but that's why there's all the talk about the child care desert, right? And so even for the groundbreaking for the new YMCA, you had state officials there talking about the child care desert and how the Y itself is actually um, they're hoping to help tackle yeah, that filled, and yes. through financial support from the state be able to offer some additional programming. Um, you know what, I, before you guys leave, I'll run upstairs and grab it. I just forgot to bring it down, but I, uh, Lindsay and I also received packets uh, for the new YMCA, including some photos and renderings of what the inside looks like. Um, and it's so cool because they have really tried to embrace the Canandaigua community. There's all kinds of um, images and equipment inside the building, building to pay homage to the Roseland Park. Uh, there's even a Skyliner inside the building, including photos and backdrops. There's playground equipment. They almost, they've actually had, um, they've replicated some stuff after Motion Junction. And they've involved Mike Bentley, who's been working with us, as you know. Uh, they've made improvements to the pool to make it more inclusive for everybody to be able to use. And they're actually building a miniature version of Motion Junction inside the building. So it's, cool. there's, there's so many very, very cool things. I love this, so. so on this, what do you need from, from the committee? Um, a, a recommendation would be great. I have a budget workshop meeting on Monday with the town board. It's already earmarked in the uh, preliminary budget for um, contracting with another entity. I just so everybody knows, and I told Lindsay this, I did have a conversation with the city manager encouraging the city to also reach out to the Y to try to partner just because it's a whole nother level of offering, right? Versus what we did So before. this is just Canandaigua Town. And the Y. Residents, yes. just the Y. Not it's open to everybody, but the town residents would receive that discount. The $40? Yes. So it's open to everyone for the 288. Yes. Uh, I, I see. So the city can, it can continue. With their own program. With, the, with the program, right. the way it, right. yeah. yes. Good luck with that. Lindsay's been working on this. She's been super excited. What else do you want to add, Lindsay? I don't know. I'm so excited about it. I just, I see it as a huge benefit for everybody. And just to see our park get used the way it should, I think that's huge too. So, and then if people don't, if that's not the experience they're looking for, they have other options, which I think is great, you know, still with the city program um, or the outhouse being an option. So. I just want to thank the committee too, just for the support. And the outhouse option really will be more like what we previously offered. That's really more of a basic program. And then hopefully in future years, we can expand that. So. But, but I would see even the outhouse 
program being expanded because of the connection with the Y and with the Y being right across the street, right well, across the street, almost yeah. right across the street, right. now that they've opened the road again. Right. So. right. Well, and just so everybody knows too, <coughs> excuse me, the Y, uh, I've been having conversations for months with the Y about um, the connection pieces to outhouse into motion junction, the civic center, how this really is becoming the recreation corridor, the Auburn trail. We've been having these conversations probably for even back into last year. Um, so they're very, very excited about it. And they're super excited about motion junction and ways to incorporate that. Well, I think anything we can do, I mean, you leave the Y now and there's another berm that goes right along the, the ice rink property right. to outhouse park. Right. Out, out their front walk is going to be the Auburn Trail. Right. So I think anything there that's, this just builds on that. Right. Or that builds on this. <laughs> Whichever way, right? That's all. Well, I think it's, I think it's smart to use what other, whatever is available to Absolutely. us to reduce costs and yep. expand our program and, and potentially make it better because right. uh, I, th I think if you have happy parents, you're going to have happier kids. <laughs> Um, I went through one other thing out there. One of the things that uh, we've kind of had some initial conversations about, you know, that we had uh, previously advanced a proposal to hire a recreation director. I really believe, I truthfully believe, and we got to take it one step at a time, but I believe that this opportunity partnering with the Y may be able to replace that need to hire a separate recreation director. They have programming. Um, they would be, we've even had conversations with them about maybe incorporating the senior program and helping. They're that, very, yeah. and, and of course, they have these big pools. They have all these yeah, other things. I mean, there's so many more program offerings that we can include by incorporating with the Y. And that's not to say we wouldn't still have the cards or some of the other stuff. Well, but. The, the issue with the current Y and uh, and the senior program is its accessibility, which it isn't. Yes. Right. And um, I'm, I would assume that the new one would provide accessibility. Yeah, and the second, or the new one, uh, the second story, there's a gym overlooking the pool. I mean, it's just very tastefully <laughs> done. The, the, you, you'll, you'll see, I'll run upstairs and grab some renderings of it, but you'll see. So. Yeah, I can hardly wait to use a gym. <laughs> well, I don't want to speak for the committee. I, 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 I mean, are there any, anyone that's, do we stop moving forward for this? I, I, well, are we good? I will move that we uh, go ahead and move forward with this. And uh, if we need a resolution for the town board, I would propose that we do one. I don't think it's just a motion with a second is, okay. is sufficient. And just so we know that the Parks and Rec Committee is Isn't, in support. We're, we're, in, we're in support of, of proceeding with a proposal to, yep. to partner with the Y for the one year trial period. Mm -hmm. Yep. and move forward with it and That's evaluate right. after a year yep yep and we'll see there's always yep. there's always things that we learn as we go through this process right the other thing is uh in and just i know that i don't know that we've done the last couple of years maybe we have but um we always used to do surveys and we yeah. keep hearing about the surveys and the hours and everything the y also does surveys yes. and so we'll get all that data back from i was just going to ask so, if we would have a survey afterwards yep. yeah <laughs> Keep Good. going, Doug. All right. <laughs> You're not, okay. All right. So we'll jump back to Uptown. And anything else on that, Lindsay? No, no, not at all. Thank you. All right. So let me share my screen here. And uh, let's see. I'm just going to share the screen here. And then let me jump over here to, oh, let me move this out of the way. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to go to Encore here for a second. So there is a lot happening in Uptown. Some of you uh, may know, some of you may not. Um, we rezoned a big portion of uh, this area into something called form-based code in Uptown. And these areas in yellow, with this being Blue Heron Park, right where my cursor is, every parcel that I've highlighted in yellow is a parcel that we know of where development is already proposed and that we're actively working with developers on parcels. And so you can see that it, there's really a lot of interest in Uptown. There's a lot of excitement about the form-based code and what that means. So essentially there's, there's two types of zoning code. There's a Euclidean zoning code, which is the traditional old fashioned kind of, you have to be 20 feet set back from the sides or the rear or whatever. With form-based code, it's all about the look. 
It's a certain look that you're trying to get out of a specific area. It's typically used in areas where you want uh, greater density, more of like a city, mini city, suburban type setting. Um, it's not commonly used in rural areas. And that's what's so unique about the town of Canada. Well, we have very rural areas. The map right behind Mark is our strategic farmland protection area here in the red. And so we know we have a lot of prime soils there. We know we have steep slopes and natural resources. We have a strategic forest area behind my head um, that really is that southern portion. But when you when you boil that all down and you look at what's left after you've really identified all those natural resources and the steep slopes and the scenic view sheds that's up there on the purple map up there and then uh, the pink and the steep slopes over there, you have that area just above the city of Canandaigua that's on that map behind uh, Mark there, just north of the city of Canandaigua along nothing. 332. And that's uptown. And that's really the area that we've, uh, that we've identified. That's where really the future of the town of Canandaigua the most development and the greatest density can occur. And there's the infrastructure there. There's the roads, the water, the sewer, et cetera, that can really support that. Um, I wanna show you something real quick before I get to, to that. Uh, the other thing is, interestingly enough, as, and we start to look at data and kind of what's going on. Is that not gonna work for me? We have the census data and there's three census tracts in the town of Canada. And we start to look at based on the 2020 data, kind of what's going on and, and where, sorry, I was gonna close that, but there it goes. Um, kind of what's what's going on, more or less the population of the town of Canada but based on the 2020 census is, uh, is about 11,000 people. You've got about 5,700 on what we would say would be this west side of Canada Lake, this general area over in here. And then you've got about another 5,000 in that uh, area uh, east side of Canandaigua Lake, this area over in here, that's all the town of Canandaigua, and then you've got another 2,700 in this area north. What's, what's interesting to me about that, and I think I may have a statistic, yeah. So according to our population data currently, 51% of the residents of the town of Canandaigua live south of 5 and 20. 48% of the residents of the town of Canandaigua, as of the 2020 census, live north of 5 and 20. My point in telling you that is when I start talking about these new developments in Uptown, you are going to see that the population actually north of 5 and 20 is going to be significantly higher than the population of the town of Canandaigua south of 5 and 20. And while we have these beautiful parks like uh, Onanda and obviously Butler Road Beach, one of the things that I think that we need to be cognizant of is our park <clears throat> amenities north of 5 and 20 because that's where the population center is. And realistically, we have Blue Heron Park and Outhouse Park right now are the only, and Motion Junction now, but that's really part of Outhouse, are the only two real parks that we have north of 5 and 20 to serve this, this greater population area. Another data sat here that from this, uh, from this information, you can see here some of the different categories of each of the different subsectors. Um, 21%, this was interesting to me, this, this, this area that is kind of this north eastern piece here, the 332 East. Um, this district has the so second lowest percentage of people age 18 and over, meaning as the percentage of this district has the second most young people 17 and under in that particular district for the entire town of Canandaigua. So, and you really start to see that again here in this other category, this again is north of five and 20, where 34% of those surveyed were 17 and under. So you've got a pretty significant growing population of younger people in the town of Canandaigua north of 5 and 20. And again, the only thing that we're serving in terms of parks amenities currently is Outhouse Park and Blue Heron Park. Um, so I'll skip well, through. Go also ahead. the YMCA and the uh, Civic Center also serve that age group. Absolutely. Of course, the Y when, at the time, the Y wasn't there yes, right, for understand. the 2020 census, but yes. Um, so you have the why there. Here's some of the other data and everything. And I can always send this out to you and you can circulate this around and, and look at some of this. Um, I think, oh, do I have an overall here? Uh, yeah, this is uh, overall for these two categories. So you've got 55% uh, 17 and under, 55% of the town lives north of 5 and 20, 44% lives south of 5 and 20. Mm -hmm. And the stars here are the parks, essentially, our, our park facilities. Kind of lopsided. It is a little bit lopsided. So, I mean, just keep that in mind as you're talking about parks and park amenities and the different things. <laughs> Nothing is ever going to replace Butler Road Beach and Onanda. They're one of a kind. So, I mean, right there. But think about the resident that lives on Brickyard Road. 
it takes them, or even from my house, I live in the town of Canandaigua, it takes me about 20, 25 minutes to drive to Ananda. Oh, well, yes. Right? So there's another section of the town that, you know, yes, Onanda is a one of a kind, don't get me wrong, but that's a hike. That's not going, taking your kid and, and running over there, right? Do you so. have um, an idea of the uh, elderly population of that? that area it, it is we have that that the census data is in here too I, I can share that with you so let me jump back over here so now knowing that and of course let me just zoom out for a quick second five and twenty is obviously down here right and then here's out house park right here we just highlight that so we all so there's out house park there but that's not our focus for the purpose of this conversation so zooming back into this area so then I just showed you those population numbers and the increase here. We're potentially talking about two to 3,000 additional residents living in Uptown over and above what I just showed you. So it's going to be significantly lopsided in terms of the population. So let me show you, um, let me start with, uh, so here's Blue Heron Park again. Here's the fire station. This is Parkside Drive. Let me start with Edgemere Development. Edgemere Development is our very first form-based code official application that has come into the town of Canandaigua. That right here is DePaul Trolley Station, the 48 unit apartment building that has been constructed. Uh, DePaul lives uh, here. This one here is Liberty Apartments. This is another 48 unit apartment building. This one is geared towards veterans, just so everybody knows. This one is geared towards independent living, but with assistance. Uh, this is Candlewood Apartments here. Not too long ago, we constructed 32 new townhomes right here. But this one right here, this little parcel right here, I just wanna show you what uh, that would look like. So Edgemere has made application to, to us now to build a new 48 unit apartment building under the form-based code. And this is the rendering of what it would look like. And I want to just see the rendering because specifically this area, when it grows up, it's going to take five, 10 years. This isn't going to happen overnight. This is all about planning and long term planning. But you have to start to think about almost like a micro city. You have to start to think about how it looks differently and how it's going to have different functions than the rest of the town of Canandaigua. That's why we created the Uptown Business Improvement District, because there's going to be certain needs that this area is going to have that the rest of the town isn't going to have. And so to be able to financially support that, that would be paid for by the businesses in that particular area. So this building, for instance, is an example. This is 48 um, affordable workforce housing style homes. Some are one bedroom, some are two bedrooms, some are three bedroom. And Interestingly enough, let me tell you, I was, I was at a conference today, um, actually it was down here at the New York Kitchen, the New York Planning Federation, and uh, this was actually used as an example, and our form-based code was used as an example, and our town planning board chairman came up to me during a break and he said, we looked at this application last night and he said one of the things that we were concerned about is parking. It's 48 unit apartment building and they're proposing 42 parking places. And um, I said, Chairman, with all due respect, my biggest concern is public transportation. Yeah. I don't really care about the parking place. It's affordable housing. We'd be lucky if each of the apartments had one car, right? <laughs> the bigger concern is, <laughs> is there a bus shelter for the public transportation for them to, or, you know, be able to, uh, to wait for the bus? Is there, are the sidewalks and where's the, where are the scooters? Where are the bicycles? Where's all that? Is it connecting, right? One of, the, one of the things that this particular development is uh, associated with the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal, the company, the developer that's doing it, uh, Edgemere Development, uh, they've done quite a few of these uh, buildings across the state of New York that work very closely with the state of New York. One of the requirements to actually get approved through the state for this is they have to actually provide a playground. And, you know, it's already, I showed you how such a tight lot it is to begin with, and um, we were having a conversation about does the playground end up in Blue Heron Park versus at this site? Well, the state came back to them and said, no, it has to be on your particular site. So they're going to have to construct a small playground. 
but it does go to back to the question. I know we've debated it a couple of different times. What does the future of Blue Heron look like? Does it include a playground or not? It might need to. You know, when you start thinking about all of these different style buildings. Um, so this is the first one. Any questions on this one? Now, so that's that's this parcel. Let me zoom back out here for a quick second. So here again is Blue Heron Park. Let me show you this one. This will be probably the signature flagship project for Uptown. Uh, and it's actually a development project called Uptown that, Landing. That's all of those? All of these parts. Together. It's 100 acres. <clears throat> that's one project called Uptown Landing. It's, it's a mega project. Um, and where did I put it? Here it is. So again, I, I think just go oh, right there. It goes. Here's Blue Heron Park. Okay. That parcel I just showed you is right here. That's Edgemere. Now, look at that. And I'm going to show you some other photos of that and stuff. This will be done in phases. Phase one over here. This is uh, Airline Road right here. This is where Vision Nissan is on 332 in the road when you come in there. And when you come back here, this is Fire Hall Road. This is Blue Heron Park. Parkside Drive is down here. Phase one is over here. Phase one being um, apartment buildings. Uh, also what we call flex space. Uh, 20,000 square feet of flex space is something that routinely gets requested for these days where it can be used for any number of either light manufacturing, it could be used for office space, it could be used for any number of different things. That's, that's kind of in this area here as well, some manufacturing buildings you can see here. The whole concept, popular concept actually across the country now is a concept that you see a lot of small cities really building towards is called live work play and the idea is to live work and play all on the same site where you never need a vehicle you are there and so they are really trying to and they let me tell you who they are this is a developer um, it's a series of developers that have come together to bring this project together um, the, the gentleman's name is jeff cook who is the principal property owner uh, Cook Properties. Cook Properties is the largest uh, manufactured house housing uh, company in the state of New York, but it may actually even be in the entire East Coast now. Uh, they are growing like crazy. I actually, somebody told me recently they're the largest in the nation. I don't know if that's true or not. But that was mentioned at the affordable housing. Yeah, they, they are large. Um, now, a little story about Mr. Cook. Uh, Jeff Cook originally my first interaction with Jeff Cook was in 2017 when he joined our form, our Uptown study committee. And uh, he really got involved with us very early in this process with the form based code. And um, he said, I really like where you're going with this. And he said, I, I think that there's a real opportunity in the future for this. And I kind of joke, I, I seriously, I even jokingly said, well, you know, if, if you like that much, why don't you buy some property, right? Well, it wasn't too long he came back to us and he said, I wanted to let you know I bought all the office buildings on Parkside Drive. <laughs> Today, Cook Properties, when you go down Parkside Drive, all those office buildings oh, on the right hand side, that's all Cook Properties owns all of those. He'd been looking at this and working many, many years to try to get this. He's now has all this property under his acquisition under Cook Properties. And he's brought on other entities like Capstone Properties, which is Dom Lasher that has done uh, development, for instance, with um, uh, Factory 243 in the city of Canandaigua, many, many they other. The old Y. It, the old y, y building. The, actually, the building the Y is moving out of, they bought yeah. that. Um, these are developers with the money and wherewithal to pull this together. Now, this is a big project even for them. And so they're bringing in other entities. They have had, I know they had a conversation recently, I believe, with another entity that we've been talking to out of Rochester. But essentially, what they're looking to do is uh, build a concept, live, work, play, where you would have um, many different types of uses actually all in the same property. So I told you about the flex space, I told you about the apartment buildings. You've got apartment buildings you can see in here. I can probably zoom in on that a little bit more so you can see that a little clearer. You've got some apartment buildings here. They even have come in with some concepts like uh, townhomes, even some brownstones. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. This is in my way for me to move. Yep. Um, you what? come down the main road, this, this road where the green is, that'll be called Uptown Boulevard. And then these are high rise apartment buildings here. Um, and so it really creates a greater sense of density. Now, 
you may say, go ahead, you had a question first before I tell you what this well, is. Regarding parks. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're essentially creating a, a, a city-like yes, environment yes. mm -hmm. with, within a town. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when I did research on parks, and I brought it up about pocket parks. Mm -hmm. And there is one in Factory 243, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And used, by the way, mm -hmm. almost all the time. There's mm -hmm. some that's someone there, including teenagers, which really surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that each of these developers should have in mind a a concept for a pocket park. It'd be great to see little pocket parks. It'd be great to see them um, close to the sidewalk so that people would have a place to sit when they're waiting for a bus. These and what? it would serve two purposes. So these developments, uh, this particular development will have at least two community centers, maybe three, and it has pocket parks and everything. But there's something else I want to show you that we had specifically asked for that they have been very gracious, I feel like, to agree. These buildings right here are tentatively placeholders, essentially uh, for us. One of the things that I had asked them to consider was uh, buildings that are very close to the property boundary of the park that could house like restaurants, first floor type retail establishments. Imagine sitting there on the patio eating, looking out over yeah. Blue Heron Park, or then going for a yeah. walk in Blue yeah. Heron Park, those types of things. So they're very willing to work with That's us, wonderful. whatever it is that we're asking for. They want to be a, a partner. And that was the reason I told you about the, the backstory with Jeff Cook. He absolutely wants to be a partner. So does Dom Lasher. So do some of the other folks that they've brought in. Now, speaking of pocket parks, uh, let me go this way. So for instance, here's yep. a small pocket park. Yep. That's one of the renderings that they've provided to us, right? And there's any number of different variations of pocket parks that you could do, but you see that's where this particular one is here built in, in between the buildings, pocket parks. Um, predominantly in these high rise apartment buildings, these are four story parks. You've got tree lined streets, you'd have sidewalks, you'd have any number of really outdoor and indoor spaces. Uh, associated with all of this. Obviously, you've got some, that's an example of like the restaurant, the outdoor mm -hmm. seating that they would incorporate. It really has a different feel, more yes, like a does. city, it right? Does. A city environment uh, <clears throat> that you're really talking about. Here's an overview rendering kind of of what it would look like, some of the buildings, that sort of thing. One of the things, uh, this main road, this main road, I think that they're really planning for a substantial amount of retail on this main road. But again, keep in mind, it's going to take years to build out. One of the things that I've said repeatedly to them is I, I am concerned about parking and I've asked them to really consider some parking garages uh, as built into the development because you think about the apartments, you think about the different things, even people just wanting to visit the park. If we're creating an atmosphere, because we're really giving them a lot of benefit by enabling them to have this density in return almost building around the park. I mean, think about the view from some of these apartments overlooking a park. It's almost a miniature version of Central Park, right? <laughs> Where you have apartments near a municipal park as the centerpiece when you really start to think about the future of what that looks like. Um, so there's any number of things. And so when there's needs like community centers or when there's needs like parking and those types of things, I think we're absolutely within our right to ask them to provide any of those types of uh, different amenities. Um, so I know one of the, the purposes here today was to talk about Blue Heron Park. But what, it, what I would almost say to you is, in some aspects, I think we're gonna have to be flexible as the plan evolves, right? Even and, more flexible than I thought we were gonna have to be, yeah, right? right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, some of the stuff, uh, that's not a good example. This was actually, um, you can see uh, Savannah Street and in in, uh, Adventure, but there, it's also near East. This is actually in Rochester. This is a mock-up of uh, this is some of the buildings that they've actually done. Uh, some different designs, some different styles, some different things that uh, incorporating. You see the first floor retail, the glass. Our form-based code actually requires 70% glass on the first floor. Um, so they would have to be, whether it's offices or restaurants or retail or whatever, uh, different types of uh, glass type uh, establishments there. But the thing I would impress upon you the most is the great thing is I think the most important thing with with it not that's not a good example that was just something else. Um, with both of these big developments, 
this one and the Edgemere development, both of these developers want to be a partner with us and they want to they want to work with us. And so these are like uh, stormwater ponds here, uh, but also um, there's some areas there potentially for green space. The other concept that I have floated, I don't know if you know or not, but the pond at Blue Heron Park is actually part of the Route 332 drainage district. Yes. It's actually the water drains from 332 in this entire area as the uh, quantity storage for this entire area. While New York State DEC laws require that they have on-site quality treatment requirements on their parcels, that does not necessarily require them to have quantity. So if we have the ability, and this is where it really does get into some negotiation and trading, right? If they could treat their stormwater you talk about there's a lot of stuff going on here, but we could accept more of the quantity in our pond at Blue Heron Park that may include changing to the pond a little bit. We may then be able to get additional space in their development for additional park amenities or community center or whatever. So I, we, we've got a lot of flexibility here. and. You know, the great news is the landowners are very willing to work with us. The other thing I throw out there is um, the school district has a building that is right side of the road, is it? Let me go back to this one. Uh, right here. So this is the school district has a building here. And you see that this pond is technically on this parcel and everything, and then their their new road. You know, we've we've asked that the road, the big thing is when you're talking about dense development, you also have to be talking about traffic, right? And so one of the things that we know we need is the, the road to extend up here and then wrap around, come up through this development and connect to this road. You have to have the roads connecting. So that may mean altering this pond a little bit. But one of the things that we've talked to them about is how can we incorporate the school building into some of this development, what, whether it's buffering. What is that building? That's the what is CACC. It? Yeah. The what? It's like the uh, alternative ed oh, okay. building, CAC. But they do a lot of things like uh, they, I know they have chickens there. They teach environmental stuff. I know that they walk the park. One of the things that they asked was if they could um, um, do some different things with the trees and everything at Blue Heron. <laughs> they use it as an outdoor education space, which is super cool. There's an apple tree right here. I've told them repeatedly, go pick the apples, go have fun with the apples, use it. I mean, it's it's there, right? Um, and just incorporating the use of that. I know that they have launched their canoes multiple times into the pond uh, to teach kids how to uh, uh, canoe and everything. <laughs> so this park really is an interesting is an interesting piece because I can't tell you exactly maybe what the needs are specifically for that park, but that park is really the centerpiece of this entire area. And I feel like it's going to be used for many different things. It's going to be used for the, the escape, the respite. It's going to be used for the outdoor education stuff. It's going to be used for, you know, whether it's Frisbee golf or something else. The other thing is, I know, and, and I'm sure Lindsay's still on the call, I just minimize the thing. I've seen more and more people even using the pavilion, having lunch with all the offices mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. there, right? So as this develops, and we're talking to the developers, you know, it may even be worth doing a small feasibility analysis for this particular park, similar, smaller scale than what we did with Onanda and going through that exercise. You know, we have the Parks and Rec master plan that certainly had some ideas, but we have much better ideas on what Uptown's going to look like than when we did. Yeah, when we did our master plan, there was none of the discussion yeah. right. about yeah. any of this. Right. So, yeah. Could, could you click back on, on the bigger picture with the this, this schematic there? Sure. It's right here. Yep. So, so what are they, so behind that green space, what, what's? These are all manufactured homes. Okay. They single just, family homes. Single family homes. They'll look uh, they'll look um, much like a single family home with a garage. Um, one of the things I have asked them to a couple of different times is if they would rear load the garages so you get that community sense with the front porch and that sort of thing. So we're still kind of working through some of those types of things. But uh, these are all manufactured uh, single family homes. That particular section, uh, their plan for that is 
where individuals would own the manufactured home. They would be ground set homes on uh, block foundations, and then they would retain ownership of the land, meaning that there would be lot rent uh, lease space uh, in those particular areas. The rest of this would be uh, pretty much all of this would be rental type situations uh, with the townhomes, with the apartments, uh, obviously the flex space, the office space, that's all rental. Uh, so this all uh, becomes retained by, you know, the corporations that own the parcels and then they become the responsible entity, obviously, for the parcel. Now, the other thing is I'll throw out because I haven't said it yet. You, you may remember last late last year after we adopted the form based code, we also adopted a form based code parks fee over and above the parks fees. So there's two types of parks fees now in the town of Candago. There's the planning board has what's called a park lane and Lua fee. When the, somebody applies to the planning board to subdivide a parcel, they make application of the planning board and the planning board then has to make a decision whether or not to charge the parkland in lieu of fee, meaning that there is a requirement when somebody's creating a subdivision that they have to create a new park or they pay a fee. And so our customary practice with the planning board is to charge that fee and that fee is assessed to thousand dollars a unit. So if somebody's building a, a uh, housing development that has 40 units in it, they would pay $40,000. Now, over and above, and there's very specific uses, I should say, also for that park and rec in lieu of fee. It can only be used for new improvements. It can't really be used for maintenance, that sort of thing. One of the things that I think is just going to be monumental for us in the future for the town of Candegua is our form-based code fee, park fee, has nothing to do with that law. The form-based fee is a fee that has been created now by the town board that every single unit in the form based code has to pay a thousand dollar fee that will then be used for parks and recreation maintenance everything so when you start talking and that's a one-time fee though but you really start to think over the next 10 years all this new development and i haven't even showed you everything yet but all this new development coming online you could potentially have hundreds of thousands of dollars in new revenue sources coming in that could be used for parks and recreation outside of the general fund of the town that is can be used for maintenance it can be used for expansion it could be used for improvements it could be used for anything is it just for the parks in the uptown area or for all parks in in this area so parks but, recs and trails it could be any anything, any, anything parts has there right? been any vision for any type of, of walking trails or anything within this yeah around so, that or yeah so this would this very much would be like side city like so yeah. it'd be sidewalks and everything connecting everything um we have had a preliminary conversation <coughs> excuse me about maybe some connection points to the trail that's here in the park um you know maybe there's improvements to the trail in the park um, you know, one of the things that we had a, a very early on preliminary conversation about is maybe incorporating similar elements. Once we figure out what their like lighting is, maybe we incorporate that in Blue Heron also to have similar elements, right? In continuity, both continuity right throughout. Um, so where go, is Blue Heron now? Right, right here. This okay. is all Blue Heron. Right so here. is, is there area available to expand Blue Heron Park? Um, no, not necessarily, no. Because in the realm of things, it seems really small. Well, so go back to this and, you know, it's let me zoom out here for a second. So I hear what you're saying, and, and obviously there's a big piece taken yeah, up by the, the pond. The pond, right. Now, the other thing is, I would say we can do a better, a much better job of utilizing our space that we have in Blue Heron Park. You know, I know that we've had some conversations. Did I was talking use... to Lindsay about like even a bridge over to the island. Think of a gazebo or something on the island. I mean, there's no reason not to incorporate those spaces that we already have. Like doing some unusual things that we don't Being creative. ordinarily do. Right. Yeah. Who's going to do that? So we have Sam some... and Andy. <laughs> Well, and think about it, if you have this additional revenue source, right? So the other big thing is the developers have all said to me, okay, we're willing to buy into the vision, right? We have the whole uptown, um, we have the whole uptown form-based code, right? They're like, we're willing to buy into the vision, 
But you're going to do something about your park. You got to do something about your fire station. Right? Because mm -hmm. they're spending literally millions mm -hmm. of dollars. They want to also see that the town is investing in this area also. So that's why we have things like the Uptown Business Improvement District. We'll be doing, like right now, there, we were just having this conversation last week. There's 74 light poles on 332 in the Uptown Business Improvement District, and only about 30 of them work. You know, so it's stuff like that. We've got to do a better job also, right? So this was from the Uptown Feasibility Study, and, and I really don't believe that we're going to do this, but That's this is an example. Pump. This is the current fire station, right? So this is the way it could look. Now, I've actually been looking at different fire stations that could be multi-purpose fire stations, right? Where you could have, in Toronto, I saw a beautiful fire station that was a three-story building. Half of the one floor was the base for the trucks. And you almost had the fire station actually vertical with office buildings, and then you had a whole community accessible section on the other side of it. There's so many things that we could be thinking about. So that, that's one of my questions. You had the fire department, mm -hmm. the, the city department. No, that town owns, owns that. I know town owns yep. that. Yep. The city uses it, though. It's part of our annual agreement. So mm -hmm. you had them at the last town board meeting mm -hmm. talking about all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. don't you need that fire hall yes okay we need the location but we don't need that building you don't need that building okay right. so you're talking yeah. just about uh um modernizing yes. improving the looks of the yes. building which i fully support it's an eyesore or maybe we have to bite the bullet in a whole new building I'm but not, that, whatever that would be my guess right but whichever we just got to get more creative about the, the way that we do you know that whole area for comparison this was an interesting comparison for the uh, form based code study area this is that area including blue heron park mm -hmm. that we that we've been looking at this is eastview mall you can fit eastview mall and all of that in that area oh good let's build a mall well that if wasn't the point it, of this come. slide karen <laughs> <laughs> but mall. just to give you a comparison of how big an area that really is right and so what the capabilities of that part, are. we don't use all that park though do we it's, uh, a lot of it is the frisbee golf and that does is get that used. the whole part all the way in the back up there or? yes all up in here this is all oh, the frisbee that's all golf. The frisbee. okay so, is there so, a code for the building height? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they can go four stories. Four stories. Mm -hmm. Don't look like they're five. Yes. Um, fully loaded. What's the what's the projected population increase in the town when this is fully occupied? Well, for so let me just show you a couple of other things real quick. But uh, there's another developer uh, that we're working with right now that's looking to build. Uh, brownstones on both sides of the road here that like you would see in Boston, uh, multi-story brownstones uh, kind of coming in off of here. We have, uh, this is also part of the form base code. We have another developer that we're working with currently. This is the old driving range parcel. It's been tied up in bankruptcy court for a little bit, but it's getting close to closing. And again, I talk about transportation. One of the things we've already said to that developer is the road has to come out here and yeah, connect out here to yeah. County Road 8 to the traffic light, right? Um, but again, you could have denser development. So, uh, and then there's another, you know, there's another 100 acres, 106 acres over here that, you know, we've had developer propose to us any number of different like townhomes, that sort of thing. And then under construction right now, we have 115 new apartments uh, that are under construction currently. So if you go up the corner there, that's and you where, see all that. Where is uh, the Happy Tales going to be? Happy Tales is going to be right there. Right here. Yep. So, really by the time uptown is built out but i think you're talking about 10 to 15 years uh probably by the time that build out i think you're probably talking two three thousand new units so that could be you know that could be four to six thousand new residents what's that percentage wise so the town of candag was currently about eleven thousand. so 40 yeah it's another 40 so to 45 percent of 50 percent how does that put us in terms of Park square footage per person once that's done. Are we way well, we're, under average? Yeah, we're already below the national average even before that. So should we be shopping for park space? We've tried. Well, so right, so that's a question that always comes up. And so there's there's decisions that have to be made about that. And that was one of the reasons why I showed you that slide earlier about that five and twenty north or south, right? Um, we do have land 
and we have park facilities. We have started to do a better job in more recent years, like we finally got Miller up and running as a park, right? We've, we're doing different things. Blue Heron is a lot more accessible than it was even four years ago. Um, Motion Junction now, right? And that was all just vacant land that was owned by the town of Canandaigua. There's another, let me zoom in on it here. There's another 70 acres, 76 acres right here. Whoops, that's the wrong one. I take that back, not that one. I clicked the wrong one. Let me remove that one so I don't offend anybody. Let me go to this one. There's another 70 acres right here that's owned by the town of Canandaigua that right now we're just letting be farmed. We, mm. You know, we could be, even with Motion Junction, right, there's the field that needs to be installed behind. We could have any number of ball fields or different things still here in Blue Heron. There's, or in our house, I'm sorry, there's still room there. We have all of this land across the street. The yes, it is a stormwater area, but I always say that I think that we could be creative and that could be used for that. Why not let it be a ball field all summer long? And sure, okay, if it rains, it's going to flood and we don't mm -hmm. use it. But why not use it in the meantime, right? right? It's we have a lot of land that we underutilize. There's there'd been some discussion back to the outhouse there. Mm -hmm. um, a possible land swap. Has there been any more movement on that? With no, okay, no, there really hasn't. Yeah, I mean, that other piece would be better to have. Yeah, I mean, we could have those conversations. the The gentleman who plans to purchase this, that currently farms all this, he's open to doing something like that if we want to. But I think that that's, you know, it's a fantastic question because it almost feels like, you know, okay, so we've done the uptown feasibility study and we've done this analysis and everything, but now that we kind of get a better idea on what's going to happen with that, we need to have a better understanding of what Parks and Rec looks like north of 5 and 20. We need to have more Parks and Rec north yeah. of 5 and 20, um, you know, Lou Aaron and Outhouse. They, that doesn't do it. And those construction fees could be or should be earmarked for development mm -hmm. of additional. But there's also any number of things going back to uh, Karen's uh, point about pocket parks, um, for instance. So this is uh, from the Uptown Feasibility Study. So this is Blue Heron Park right here. Okay. This gives you a potential of what, with the Uptown uh, form based code, you could have liner buildings, for instance, along Fire Hall Road here. Here's Blue Heron Park again here, right? You could have, for instance, this is Airline Road, so Blue Heron Park would be right back here, right underneath my cursor. This is where Vision Nissan is right here on this corner. This could be a potential redevelopment of this, and you see this is a pocket park that's built in right there. You know, so there's any number of those types of things. It may not be the 40, 50 acre park, but that's not to say that we shouldn't try, and it's also not to say that we shouldn't rethink about parks and recreational opportunities and the inclusion of unique aspects in a city-like environment. You think of a lot of cities have very small parks, but many of them, these smaller pocket parks that are earmarked to different things. And then the other thing I would throw in here is you think about all this development, right? And, and I know that this was brought up during the Parks and Rec uh, master plan, and we've talked about it. You think about what do people like when they, you think about going out in a city setting, have dinner, et cetera, you want music, you want to be arts, entertainment. We should be thinking now about how do we incorporate the arts and the cultural aspects mm -hmm. for sure. this area. We, I believe we need to, rethink the entire Blue Heron Park. Um, I mean, it's the only, it's, it's the only given we have at this point. And you're already talking construction. You already have plans in the in house. I think we should be relooking at that and not in terms of it being a um, rural town park, but in terms of it being a semi-suburban park for lack of a better term but That's what it, it needs yeah. to feed a different type of um of clientele mm -hmm. and it, you know 
that you know that's why I brought up pocket parks mm -hmm. to begin with. Right. It needs to be uh, a place where people can go and sit and read a book, or uh, the, you know, I, I see them with the checkerboards or the chess sets mm -hmm. and and things like that. It needs to be a more inclusive part to the needs of the people that are going to be living there and we don't know that yet correct you're right we don't i mean we could make some there's there's plenty of national data out there that we could look at and different things relative to this we have experiences of other municipalities that have done form-based code we can look at any number of different examples it takes some it does take some analysis to look at that and everything but we could be we could be thinking about those and then the other thing is the connection points right like the Auburn Trail. <clears throat> so we know where, generally where the Auburn Trail is going to go, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But even like making sure that we're thinking about, and I and we are, just so you know, but like for instance, this developer, we've already said, okay, if you do this development, we want an easement along the old mm -hmm. gas line to put the Auburn Trail, trail to get down. all the way over to here. And then I've also talked to this landowner about an easement, and he said he would give it to get us up to here to again connect to this whole area, right? The connection yes. piece has become right. extremely right. important. But going back to the Edgemere Development Building here, think about the small family maybe just starting out. They don't have a car. That would be a hike for them even to go to Outhouse Park. It is. Exactly. Right? So there's got to be something on this side of 332 mm -hmm. also. Yes. Uh, yeah. That, that, I. We really need to take a look at what's available on 332, what the town already owns, mm -hmm. um, because you've bragged about owning all these little pieces of places <laughs> that might be great for pocket parks. Right. Right. You know, um, right. I, right. I don't know because I haven't seen all those great little places. Right. Well, I mean, there's there's any number of them, right? There's any number of different. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. I was going to show you one over here. There's. I'm not going to be able to find it real quick while I'm looking, but there's a small one over here that's got a pond on it. You know, any type of those types of things where that can be repurposed, even if it's a even if it's a pocket park with a sitting area that's got, you know, the birds and it's got the wildlife exactly. and that type exactly. of stuff. Right? It's, it's, uh, we've, we've got to think in terms of the people who are going to use it with the, and the, the, the people who are going to be using that whole area, because not all of them are going to be living there. Some of them are going to be working there. Correct. And um, well, we already see that with Blue Heron. The people that are working in those office buildings mm -hmm. are grabbing lunch. You guys see it sitting over there at Blue Heron Park and having lunch. I, I stopped at Blue Heron Park right at, what was that, a year ago when we did the parking lot? I stopped at Blue Heron Park and then that area that connected it over to the pavilion. And I walked up to it one day because the pavilion was just full of people. It was a beautiful day and the pavilion was full of people. And I thought maybe there was an event, and but there was nothing on the calendar. And I just said, hey, is everything okay? And there was this lady, senior citizen, who was sitting there. She says, everything's great. I'm like, it's a beautiful day. And she's like, yeah. And I said, I've never seen this many people sitting here having lunch before. And she said, well, young man, you've never paved from the parking lot to the pavilion so that we could use Didn't it. Didn't I tell you that? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was working, I used to come down there all the time because mm -hmm. it was quiet. There was mm -hmm. nobody there, but I, yeah, well, back then I could walk. <laughs> right. So, I don't know that I gave you any answers tonight, but. No, but, uh, but I mean, that's what we've been saying all along is, is now that we've got a little better idea, I still don't feel like I know what's going to happen in that whole area right now to say, let's invest $100,000 yeah. in Blue Heron Park. Right, right. it's too you soon, know? yeah. Yeah. And then there's so many things, right? As you and and there's things are moving. I mean, the, the Edgemere building, for instance, that has just come together within the last, I would say, three or four months. I mean, I think it was in March when I met with Edgemere Development with uh, the gentleman that owns the property. And before that, that wouldn't have even been a thing. Right. Um, or, for instance, like the old uh, GMC dealership property, you know, we're having conversations and we've been having conversations about some retail and stuff but now we're having conversations about potential hotel conference center i mean that really starts to change the dynamics of the way some of this looks and feels and everything else um and and then when you really start to add in this now that we got this it's like oh that's big <laughs> and this is all stuff that we've just received this summer I 
I think it's exciting. The other thing I, I wanted to point out to you all, you all have access, if I can find the town website, let me go back to this a quick second. Every one of you is welcome to do this. If you go to the town website, and scroll all the way to the very bottom of the website where it says board, click on board. The username is TOC and the password is town, T, lowercase T-O-W-N, T-O-C in town. And when you log in, you can see, you're not gonna mess anything up. You can't delete anything or anything. Don't worry about it, so click away. But you can actually look at every one of our development, current development applications. You can see renderings, you can see what's going on. You can see uh, Popeye's coming in town uh, over in the uh, Roseland Plaza, Liberty Restaurants, Wide Waters Plaza, uh, the new Popeye's. You can see all of these different uh, things. Where's the rendering? Where's the rendering, I'll show you that. I was like Maybe we don't want to know everything. You might not want to know everything, but like all these different things across, I mean, the town of Canandaigua is a very, very busy town in terms of development and things going on. Uh, sometimes it's variances, sometimes it's any number of things, but it gives you, you know, you can get into as much detail as you want uh, across the entire town. These are these other two developments, these housing developments I was talking about, Uptown Point 1 and Uptown Point 2 uh, over in that area. A lot of the, uh, the Uptown name is really starting to, uh, Venezia Point, uh, Uptown, um, a lot of the uptown parcels are starting to incorporate the name uptown or something similar uh, for a lot of that you start to see in, in a lot of that. Additionally, in, on top of all that, and I'll just share with you uh, and I'll kind of wrap up here, Mark, but um, I always tell this story because I'm super excited about this, our business community in this area. So um, here's Blue Heron Park. Here's Center Point Golf Course. We all know where that is. Wow. The 109 townhomes that were built. We've got the new apartments that are under construction right now. There's 115, you see them there. We've got uh, Pactive, which is uh, one of the largest private employers in the entire region. Um, they're just doing incredible things. They've actually re-engineered their, their entire line into a Echo Earth friendly food container line. You've got, uh, I love to tell this story right here. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't, don't realize this is here, Artisan Meats. Artisan Meats is uh, getting ready to double in size. They're gonna double the size of their footprint. You go into any Wegmans, you go to the deli case, look on the left-hand side of the deli case, and there's one of these open air tray containers that has the pre-packaged sausage. You pick up the piece of sausage, the packed sausage, chorizo, whatever it is, it says on the front of it, Wegmans, food you feel good about, turn it over and look at the back and you'll see packaged in uh, Canada, New York by Artisan Meats, uh, that they're the sole distributor for Wegmans. But this one right here, I just have to touch on this. This is Acoustos Technologies. <clears throat> Acoustos Technologies is growing like crazy. They are a, uh, a wafer fiber uh, manufacturer, semiconduct chip conducting manufacturer. Um, when Acoustos first bought this building a few years ago, um, they were in there and they had about uh, 10 plus or minus other businesses in there with them. And uh, they were a startup company originally from uh, North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte and, and connected to the University of uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> Acoustos has now kicked all the other tenants out. They're the only, uh, the only business in that building. They're expanding. Uh, they own all that property that I just highlighted in there in yellow. We've given them preliminary approval to build eight additional buildings in their most recent shareholder report. They recognize Canada and New York as their world headquarters, and they've just expanded into England. Uh, and so Canada and New York really being their world headquarters. And we just heard from them that they are getting ready to come into us to start the next building. They originally talked about a helicopter pad too. Is, is that in the plans? They, uh, I don't know about the helicopter specifically. They use the airport extensively, mm -hmm. multiple times a week. You see the Acoustos jet flying in and out. And hear it. And well, actually, no, the jets you don't. You hear do it for too my much. house. Do you? <laughs> For my house, I hear them more on like the takeoff. It's like depends on which way they're going, right? Um, but uh, th that jet in particular, and of course, uh, Constellation jets are in and out all the time, also. But that jet is in and out a lot. They, it was interesting. I was having a conversation with the CEO. This goes back probably two years ago, three years ago now. I was having a conversation with him, and I said, "What can the town of Canandaigua do to support Acoustos Technologies?" And he said two things. He said, "Keep downtown vibrant." He said, "Because when." 
we're recruiting people to come work for Acoustos. We're competing with Silicon Valley. We're actually flying people in, picking them up, bringing them in. These are 150,000 plus or minus jobs and higher. Um, and then the other thing is he said, I need a vibrant housing stock in particular with some rentals and including your green space and recreation. Cause right. You think about the, these other areas, right. To be able to live in an area like uptown where you could walk out and then go to blue Heron park right. and you yeah. have the sidewalks, you have the pocket parks, you have all these different amenities. And then, Oh, by the way, either walk across the street or, you know, ride your bike or your scooter, or maybe you drive over to Acoustos because you've got that disposable and income. And right? they said that it's, when they originally you know, came to the county, but, but the, the, the selling factor for that spot was the fact that back piece of property that they said was they were considering a, te a helicopter had. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but, and they then of course they knew the airport was right there. Right. You know? yeah. So yeah. it's, it's course, great. I mean, right here. They, they are a real coup for this town, I yeah, think. Absolutely. So there's a lot happening in Uptown, let alone the rest of the town, but there's a lot happening. <laughs> well, and, and again, I, I hope that gives everybody a better idea just of what, kind of why we keep saying we got to put Blue Heron on hold. So I know we've been here a long time just with, with that part of it. So Sorry. Sorry. Um, I, Lindsay's probably all the way to Lake Luzerne by now. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> So, Lindsay, I think maybe, it, I don't know what you threw together for any sort of, of additional, uh, an update or anything, that, but maybe we could just throw that out by email or something. That works for me. There was nothing crazy. I think the meeting, what we went over today was the most important part. So, yeah. that works for me. So, if, if you wanted to, a after your, your uh, vacation away, send that along and I can forward just kind of your update that you usually share. Any any big issue thing that, that you need from us right now to get out of the way to cross off your list or I mean of course there, there's two things, but it's some we could just talk about it um via email. It was just the verbiage for keeping the dogs off of the playground portion at motion junction. Yeah. Just um a recommendation from you guys for that. And then just your support for um the exploration for a digital senate outhouse. Um the reason that's important is because I have it in the budget this year but it goes against um current town code so it would just be nice to have um obviously the support from you guys so i can go to the town board for approval to explore um options for that sign like we had discussed okay okay um that we could put it out house but those are the only two things really that are i wouldn't say pressing but um important did you have anything else i, I had emailed you about the the um the cabinet for halloween yeah, so nope, you guys, we're good for abode um, for you guys to man that uh, cabin, as far as I know. I know Oksana was was good with that. So um, that is on October 29th. So I'm hoping you guys will attend. Yeah, just like every other year, we'll, we'll do the same setup. We'll, uh, I'll touch base next week. We'll get set with, with candy bags and, and we'll do everything like we did the last couple of times. So. Sounds good to me. This is my first Halloween at Onada, so <laughs> You'll enjoy I don't know it. what that means, but I'm excited. <laughs> a, oh, did I put the... You put the 27th, which oh, I thought okay. it was. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because so on the agenda, it's, it's wrong. It's Saturday. It's whatever that Saturday is. Downtown has something. The same day. Yeah. 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 So, but... Um, so, Lindsay, did you have anything more? I, I guess I really don't have an understanding of the environmental fair on the 22nd. The expectations um, I, or, or anything with that or. Honestly, I'm not sure what the expectation for the committee is. I know my team just has to set up tables and chairs that Friday beforehand. Um, I know it's for more informational for ECB. I, I really don't know what they're looking for from Parks and Rec, but I can follow up with Adeline. Okay. Yeah, if you just want to let me know that next week and, and we can touch base on that. So Okay, that sounds good. But we're jumping right through here pretty quick now. So <laughs> uh, any any anything senior programming? Yes, anything I know we talked you know? I know we talked briefly. So Karen Quail Summit, they lost um, Becca. So she's no longer working there. So right now it's just Wendy trying to coordinate things. Um, so I did have a meeting two weeks ago with just Wendy and 
as of right now, the things that are on that calendar are still happening. But as far as like more details with that, I, I don't have that right now. Okay. Um, we because did add that. that yeah, they, used ahead, to put, they used to put the events other than the cards. So people know about the cards. But uh, the events they would put on Facebook and, uh, you know, the people would see that on Facebook. And I haven't seen anything on Facebook from, from Quail Summit. So I know they had something during the summer. And, uh, you know, I can't remember everything. And I didn't. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know Becca left until I showed up to the meeting, and they're like, "Becca no longer works here." Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so I should have more. Laura and I are supposed to touch base um, next week, so I'll get more information, Karen, and just advertising. Okay. But other than that, just that bus, that added bus trip on the twentieth. Okay, and uh, I am going to um, contact. Uh, Brian Emerson about uh, back um, piggybacking on the Victor for um, bus ride bus trips because I now have an idea of what people are looking for in bus trips and maybe we can uh, okay. come, up, come up with some if you let me know when the new um, parks and recreation booklet comes out I think it comes out what in February. You know, yeah, usually February first. That's going to be very different without our connection to the yeah, city this year. That'll we'll be so. One. Yeah. So, will we have any? Oh, do, we don't know if we'll have any. We'll have to work something out, but we can always do something electronically, which is what that ended up being last year anyway. It was just an electronic booklet last year. It wasn't okay. printed, unless but somebody printed it for you. But perhaps we could be in the Victor book yeah. as available to Canandaigua residents too. Yeah. All right. So, do you mind if do you mind if I bring that up to Brian? No, by all means, do. All right. Just loop me in. You know, if you guys yeah. happen to have a meeting or something, I'd like to attend. I will. So, so two of the things then that Lindsay mentioned, we talked at our last meeting about the need for maybe some more things spelled out at Motion Junction. Um, and, and, and Lindsay, even even if there's other things you know that come up, and, and Doug, your your conversations with Mike Bentley. When all of a sudden, you know, there's something happening at Motion Junction that technically our code doesn't, uh, you know, ban some sort of use. I think if something comes up that that, that group is seeing, by all means, you know, if, if that needs to be addressed in our code. Um, we talked about dogs that was one of the big thing at, um, unless they're service animals. So I think just adding that one line then to our town code addresses that issue. But yeah, I, and I did want to be I did want to be really specific with that, though, because I don't want, you know, I don't want too many no's for things, you know, like, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. So the verbiage on there is very specific that no dogs on the playground itself, whereas like Outhouse West dogs are welcome, you know, obviously in that space when you're thinking about the future, just on that playground portion. So I hope the verbiage, you know, I hope you all agree with that part. Well, Lindsay, let's talk about it because maybe it's as simple as we say something like, and again, thinking about towards the future, if we end up doing something with another field, field, um, no dogs on artificial surfaces, you know, those types of things. Yeah, you know, something more generic. Yeah. Stuff, okay. So anyway. it, 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 I don't want to speak for everybody, but we're pretty happy when you guys are, you know, come up with those ideas. We're yeah. pretty supportive yeah. Yeah. and. and I don't feel the need to nitpick and go through a lot of the, the the verbiage and all that stuff. So, but there there is an issue. I was Lindsay and I didn't even get a chance to talk to you today because I was down at that training. But uh, Mike Bentley was there, and we were having a conversation about there's um, the ramp being a little bit slippery. slippery. But I think that's actually probably going to need to be a uh, have the town attorney file a warranty claim. Uh, with the company because their product, it sounds like, is uh, something that needs some assistance more than mm -hmm. us doing yeah. something. So, hmm. so, so yeah. I, I mean, whatever you guys want to work out for for any, and I know the ordinance committee is going to look at that, and it might change two or three times anyway. So, um, and the, and then the, the other thing, and and Lindsay, I don't know how much background, just the idea of an electronic sign or a digital sign at Outhouse Park. Yes, with, so, the, with it saying the town of Canandaigua, because I hear from all sorts of people, 
You know, it's great that the city put that park in there for all of the handicapped people. <laughs> but, the city didn't do it. <laughs> so, so, Lindsay, I don't know if you want to share kind of what your vision was for, for that. I, I know that, that we talked about, you know, a, a, a digital sign maybe that, that even could be updated from here. Um, yeah. Kiosk, so I, we call that. I, I think it's become more apparent, you know, as our parks are getting more and more use from you know, our events or other people having events there that having a digital sign that could potentially advertise like, okay, music in the park on Wednesday, you know, just informational. Um, and then when, you know, when there's nothing really going on, we could also use that sign. I don't know, that just says like the time or the weather or something in between. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm really get, getting the inspiration from the Civic Center sign. It, it doesn't have to be that bright or vibrant, but I think would be beneficial to the town if we had something like that one to just communicate with our residents as well especially because that area is going to be so heavily traveled you know maybe not right now but in the future it absolutely will be so i don't know after talking to a couple people there was that suggestion instead of buying banners or just putting in a wayfinding kiosk potentially putting up something like that might be more beneficial to everybody i don't know if everyone feels that way um but those were just some of the key things that i started thinking about as we were exploring signs. Where where are you thinking of putting a sign? Well, you see that, I mean, that's a good topic for conversation. Um, I would think either at the front half or the back half. I can't or yeah. Either <laughs> near Buffalo Street extension, like I'm. So, and you're talking about a digital sign like the digital signs that they have at the end? Uh, beginning and the end of the town no 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 it, it would be a smaller more like, like you, in front of the civic center that little message board that's uh, oh a, that's, a message board. yeah okay yeah so uh, because i worry about a sign that is changing and traffic on outhouse road especially with the potential of having handicapped children near the road or people walking because there's no sidewalk on that other side there's no sidewalk really on either side and um 40 miles an hour is pretty fast and i would hate to have people who weren't a paying attention well the other thing is that i don't i just don't know if you guys are aware or not we made a grant application in the state for um pretty major changes um in in some of our transportation and specifically parks uh, we're still waiting to hear back from that but that could potentially make that a full complete street and really redo that whole thing and have sidewalks and right which would be beneficial right. yes but right now it's not and i i would hate so we're not looking for a billboard type thing karen yeah, um, the model that. that i was looking at is for Really, if you were walking, say, on one of the trails, that you would be able to see it, um, where it'd be that type of resolution for someone who's walking. And then anyone, you know, obviously driving slower would be able to see it. But it, I mean, that is a, obviously a concern, you know, with changing signs. But I feel it would be more of like a static sign where it wouldn't really be changing. Like, if we had a message, message it to share, it would be, wouldn't short be a, Right. Wouldn't, wouldn't be an advertisement that's changing no, 20 that's, seconds. That's what I would A, a, a town that. informational sign. Uh, well, we talked about spending, at our last meeting, spending money on banners to announce a movie night or a concert night. Yeah, and it would be on It, there, it would, yeah. you know. Uh, Which I think would be great. And, I think it would be And great. then maybe it would say, you know, town board meeting, you know, it might have that list. And then it it, it could be a, a, a graphic of a town board meeting. Where's the town of Canandaigua sign? You know, it, it could be that with the date and the time under it, you know, static sign like that. So, yeah. I, uh, so, Lindsay, then you would need from us just um, please continue to, to look at options for what could be done there. Yeah, just that you that you would support that so I can continue to explore. We'd support any work you want to do if you want to keep working. <laughs> We're I, fine with that. I definitely think it needs a sign. So, I, yeah, I, I think that, that we I mean, is there anyone not in agreement that we... Half the town thinks so, that Happiness House owns it. The other half of the town thinks the city owns it. So, you know... Right. I think you could, I mean, that still needs to be figured out whether it's on that side of the road or the other right. side. Yeah, right, right. I know, yeah. but right. it's, it's, it's important to give it its own identity 
and it, right now it doesn't. It has this mixed message thing. There's a big sign there now that says Town of Canandaigua Park, doesn't it? Outhouse Park, doesn't the sign that's there say Town of Canandaigua? Yeah. yeah. Across the so, from but I, so yeah, Lindsay, please continue to keep working. So. Okay, <laughs> we'll do. You guys keep me nice and busy. <laughs> um, but but not until Monday now. Okay, we're gonna let you right, go. Right, right. So, uh, <laughs> but any me. anything anybody else got anything other that? But while we're talking about science, just so you guys know, please communicate with Lindsay if there's or just know that if there's something like, for instance, Halloween in Hernando or another event that the Parks and Rec Committee is doing, we have the ability to oh, put those the, on our digital Right. Oh, my God. Right. So, which, yeah. which people did talk yeah. about the movie announcement being on those, yeah, too. Yes, yeah, that. Yeah, as they came or into town. Baba Farms with yep. the uh, yep. you know, so, farm thing this week. Anything, any other? Well, good. So, Lindsay, thank you. You can... You can uh, log off away you go so well thank you guys enjoy your trip thank you so much bye okay see ya bye, bye. and so